Hello everyone and welcome back to COS, our course on commercial open source software startups and how to spin them off from a university or how to get started at a university and then spin off. So today's lecture is the third in the last part um, and the last but one lecture in total of the course and we will be talking about how to spin off from the university. In this third part uh, of the course we looked at startups, how to perform research, how research and uh, startups go together and now it's time to basically take or understand how you got the work done at a university and take it and spin it off into a startup of its own. Uh, a lot about a lot of this will be about uh, funding again, but then also practical aspects like intellectual property rights that you need to be care of, need to take care of, as well as the uh, various stakeholders in the process. So let's let's uh, get started by taking a look at the different phases of spinning off from university and how they are funded. So how you can have a living while working on your startup. The structure looks roughly like this. You initially do uh, basic research or someone does basic research, doesn't have to be you, you could come later. But from the innovation or invention perspective, there is a progress from basic research uh, through applied research to spinning off from university and ultimately uh, a startup then. And each of these phases is work that people do and people need to live. So we need to fund the work that is done by people in these phases. You can see how I split uh, the basic research, applied research and spinning off part. I sp split it off from the startup part. These initial, these initial three phases are the phases that start at the university. In the case of spinning off, you may have, you may found or incorporate during spinning off, but the spinning off phase and any associated funding still started at the university. So that is important because conditions change depending on who the recipient of funding is. For funding in the first three stages, it's the university. Uh, even if the money is earmarked for a startup, it still goes to the university first and then to the people working on a startup. But after founding or incorporation, uh, the funds go, funds can still go to the university and not the startup, but they can also go to the startup, but under very different and not as nice conditions as when they go to the university. You can also see here how the curve on how researchy and how applied the work is uh, changes. So in basic research, it's usually of very high research, fundamental nature, throwaway code, while in applied research, certainly if you're eyeing for a startup, it becomes more product oriented. So you're focusing more on usable code and something that might make sense for a startup. And the pure research focus gets lower and lower until at the startup, it's probably pretty low, if not zero. The types of funding you can get in these different phases uh, need to be classified. There's a huge amount of funding available. Here, for now, I will be talking exclusively about public funding. In the next, next and final lecture of this course, I will also be talking about uh, private investors, business angels, venture capitalists, so private or commercial funding. Here it's public funding, uh, which works well for university. Public funding mostly is, at least as respect to universities, uh, so-called public grants. A grant is a gift. 
and so you don't have to repay anything and you don't have to get give up shares and something it's a gift given to you to perform some work if it's a public grant um, there's also separate from public grant a so-called contract research um, and the difference is that public grants is something you apply for while uh, contract research is something which you get where you get a contract for and deliver it uh, to the client in public grants the intellectual property remains with the grantee the university while in contract research the uh, sponsor or the grantor um, who pays you expects to receive all the rights so public grants work well for startups because the rights stay with the university and the university can then give the intellectual property rights to the startup public grants can be, can be split further into aiming at the different phases i just uh, mentioned so aiming at supporting uh, basic research or applied research and so forth we'll see that in the next slide public grants can also go to startups even directly to a startup but uh, never to help the company or the startup cover its basic operational expenses that would be an illegal subsidy so any funding that a startup as the incorporated company receives from the state would have to be about uh, risk, risky research work to reach new market segments that otherwise would not be undertaken if it wasn't for that public support. So never the core operating expenses, but something that's considered pre-competitive research uh, for opening up maybe new markets and so forth. And then also such funds that go to a startup are never 100% of the costs that you incur. Implied in what I just said is a key observation about public grants, which is you can request money and you will then get it, but only based on the expenses of your project. It's never to make money. It's not uh, that you can... Um, charged by value no you always have to lay open your costs and say i have to i want three people to work over 18 months and this is the salary cost and that's what i'm asking to get reimbursed for so public grants are always cost-based never value-based as i said the various grants available are just broad there's really really a lot and you can see some examples here aligned with the phases or stages that research to startup might be going through so you can see in the phase column here again basic research applied research spinning off and starting up and then for each phase there is public grants there are public grants available public grants usually have a funder someone who has the money and that's usually a ministry in germany or dedicated organizations like the DFG and then they have lots of programs in which you might become a project if you get the grant a grant proposal approved so the the core basic research grant in Germany by the DFG Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft is the Sachbeihilfe pays for one or two people usually uh, the ERC advanced grant is by the European Union, pays for four people over five years or so. But this has to be leading edge research, rather still quite far away from any startup or any uh, commercial application. In the second phase of applied research, you have more commonly the German ministries, the Ministry of Economics, BMVE, uh, now the Ministry of Economics and Climate, Climate uh, Protection and the BMBF, the Ministry of Education and Research and increasingly the Ministry of uh, Verkehr and uh, Infrastructure and Internet. So digital infrastructure has its own uh, ministry now, the BMVE, and that is also becoming a big sponsor. So here the programs have already almost random name, VIP+, Plus, Start Interactive, and so forth. 
but uh, they are quite nice they will also pay for three four people over the course of 18 months up to three years so in terms of the actual money that you can claim as costs and get reimbursed uh, this goes up to a million euro and that is quite nice when you compare that with say maxing out your credit card which does not get you there there are also past applied research there are also dedicated public grants for spinning off here the constraint is that you need to show how during the runtime of the funding you will incorporate. So applied research does not require you yet to incorporate. You're testing the waters, you're validating the innovation and that there's market need, but you're not required to found a company. The dedicated spinning off public grants have the purpose of making you incorporate during the runtime of this program. You will not get the funds if you have already incorporated, but the expectation is that after receiving, after the first day of the project funded as a spinning off project, you can incorporate and you should incorporate before the last day of the project. And then you're a startup. So next phase is uh, the starting up phase where you have incorporated. That's the big blue line, which separates these phases in pre-incorporation and post-incorporation. And it is uh, additional public funds that are available there. Later on, more regular public grants that you can acquire and so forth. As soon as you make a pass that mark, as soon as you incorporate, the conditions change, not for the university, which can still receive uh, grants as before, but the team that is the startup is now of the startup. And if you want the startup to receive the funds and not the university as before the incorporation, uh, then you are facing different and more severe constraints. For example, as long as it's the university applying for funding, it will usually get 100% of its costs reimbursed. If you're going for KMU Innovativ, uh, which is nice funding, the startup will, however, not get 100% of the costs. It may only get 50% of the cost. And the state says, the, the sponsor says, well, well, we are giving you money, but we are not giving you all of it. You have to cough up the other half, for example. So it's not as luxurious after you incorporated as it was before you incorporated. But on the other hand, you have your company up and running and you can also have revenues or should have revenues, etc. So in any case, what it means, think smartly about when to incorporate because one door closes and another one opens. Now, across all, as you will see, if you're interested in public funding for a startup, as you will see, there is a lot of opportunity. And as a consequence, because it's such a large ecosystem of public grants, it can also be rather confusing. I have whole, hired whole people to just understand the funding landscape. But the basics are always the same. There is a notion of a phase of uh, that research is in, basic research applied, spinning off and so forth, which has German names like Grundlagenforschung, Angewandte Industrielle Forschung and Experimentelle Prototypentwicklung. And these names are actually explicitly used in the public, uh, in the tenders by which your attention is being called to public funds being available. And you need to understand the meaning of these words which are defined in various laws and then how the public sponsors align their programs, their grant programs with this terminology. So um, you apply to a program and then you might get a grant and that might mean you become one of the projects in the program. 
Increasingly common are the technology readiness levels and originally a NASA technology assessment model, which is more fine-grained than the basic Grundlagenforschung, Angewandte Forschung, Experimentelle Produktentwicklung. And these technology readiness levels, as you can see here in the rightmost column, is also what might be mentioned in some public tender informing you about public grants. So we are assuming that um, you have performed basic research and there's some interesting innovation which may have business potential or not. And um, after the basic research follows the applied research where you want to see the work, the basic research work in practice. So this is research that it's still research takes place at a university but you're basically refining the original ideas, usually by application, applications to domains, by working with industry partners who, if this was a startup, might be your customers. But since it's early and you don't know yet, they are really just also customers, but now to the university, and you're basically testing the waters for your technology. And applied research is usually funded through something called um, angewandte Forschungs, uh, public grants, or it's sometimes also called the validation phase or a validation project. The idea is to validate, that's where the word comes from, the commercial potential uh, of your idea or basic research innovation. And validation means the answer is, if it gets validated, the answer is yes, it's true, there is potential. Applied research is funded by the ministry a lot again. So here's an example. The Ministry of Education and Research has a dedicated program for people interested in taking their basic and applied research work towards a startup. It's called Start Interactive Module 1 and it funds three to four people over three years. So it's a lot of money you can ask for. Um, 600k, 800k, possibly more. Um, how much money is usually constrained by the program itself, but you can always make a case for how much you need, and if that is within the scope, it can be more or it can be less. So you need to fulfill requirements before you can, if you want to be successful in applying to a grant program and these requirements are also listed in the public tender and it will say things usually for validation and applied research uh, some, if there's a startup in the making it will always ask for who's the team does the team have the competencies needed what is the innovation describe the market potential of the innovation and so forth and Usually this is a two-stage process where you describe the initial idea and then if they like it, you are asked to make your final proposal. Usually if you make it past the first stage, you are with 95% probability you're in. And again, this is research to be performed at a university where if you acquire the grant, the money is earmarked for your startup project, but it still has to flow through the university which is why professors like these funds. It just lets them make more money. More money is always good in the assessment of, say, uh, university's president, but um, uh, it is still earmarked for the startup. You don't have to incorporate yet if you're even, not even sure about whether there's a valid startup in the making. That may be a good idea. So after the original research and the applied research follows the spinning off phase. So maybe your validation research led you to believe and demonstrate in a believable way, get the data points, get the signals from your industry partners that there really is a business to be built around the innovation or the ideas you have. The spinning off phase then is marked by 
the key event to happen somewhere during this phase, which is the incorporation of the startup. So the spinning off phase starts with the startup team still being at the university. And while you are at the university, you acquire the grants for the spinning off phase and it pays your salary for the duration of the whole project, even if you incorporate it along the way. So you can have a company, but not yet be officially employed or be only minimally employed there. It's still the public grant run through the university for the spinning off phase that pays your salary. So spinning off follows the applied uh, phase and the goal is to get your innovation as close as you can to a product. Terminology varies. Um, public funders to avoid claims of illegal um, uh, subvention uh, subsidies in, in the EU uh, always only sponsor pre-competitive development but of course how big the gap is from what you're doing and what the uh, uh, what the market needs so meaning how much is left for the startup after incorporation to do that is uh, everyone's guess so to spin off um, you need to uh, go through a couple of steps um, you want funding that could be the public funding for the original team it could be additional funding uh, for for the startup maybe already with employees or maybe some other expenses that are really company expenses not university expenses so you need to acquire the funding you need to found the company you need to make sure that the startup the company has all the relevant intellectual property rights that it needs for building its product uh, which it usually has to acquire from the university you build out the product meaning you create that minimum viable project product that is convincing to uh, private investors and then you acquire funding again um, that is a basic thing to know you will probably need one person who is busy with sales and fundraising managing stakeholders that takes a lot of work funding 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 so the initial funding before you incorporate so still at a university um, is uh, the spinning off funding that's what i call it here and there are dedicated public programs to sponsor exactly this phase of turning your innovation into something that you can take into a startup and then you should incorporate during that project runtime. They're a bit less than in the other domains, but uh, the most common one is the Ministry of Economies and Climate Protection Exist Forschungstransfer. That is not the Exist Gründerstipendium. Exist Gründerstipendium is something small for master students. We are talking about Exist Forschungstransfer, which gives teams of up to four people over 18 months a full salary. It's very nice. And so you apply uh, again with a team and a business plan. You're invited to pitch in front of a jury. And if you convince them, you will get the funding up to a million euro. It's quite luxurious. But the expectation, they can't force you, but the expectation is that during these 18 months of the program, you, um, you will incorporate because that is the goal. If you don't have the goal of incorporation, you will not get the funding. That's why the actual validation needs to happen before you go for these funds. The assumption is you already know that you will incorporate a startup. You just need a little bit more work to get there. And um, yeah, you need to acquire all the intellectual property for the startup uh, from the university because the university is at this stage the owner of the IP. That's because it is the university which officially received all the project funding and then the university employed you the startup team very nicely uh, full-blown salaries 
uh, of 40, of, uh, of 4,000 to 6,000 uh, uh, euro a month uh, gross and the university becomes the owner of your work. So now you want to the startup or uh, representing the startup, you have to talk with the university about give me the copyright to the code I wrote and so forth. And that is its own possibly lengthy process that you need to understand. So I will talk about intellectual property rights management um, first a bit more generally and then I will talk about it with respect to the university. First you need to understand actually as you're working on a project who owns uh, what, who holds which right. In our computer science case we are really almost always talking about copyright to a source code. Yes there could be patents in the mix but say I don't really care much for patents. I, I think I'm on two patents, but I've never personally put any energy in filing for some. And so um, it is usually the copyright that is of interest to the startup, the code that you want to build the product from. So you have, here's a two by two matrix to understand it. Um, that two parties, so there's the doctoral researcher or PhD student and there are the bachelor or master students. And depending on in which capacity they act, they own the rights to the code they work, they write, or they don't. They only own the copyright to the code they write if they do it on their private account, meaning um, for the doctoral student as part of writing the dissertation or for the bachelor and master student as a student uh, in a class. Then they are acting on their own behalf and they own the code they write. The uh, doctoral students has it a bit more difficult because uh, usually they don't write code for the dissertation. They write code as employees of the university. So as people get employed, are paid for their work, it is the employer who owns the intellectual property rights. And that is a professor hiring uh, a person for, uh, for a work on a research project. This person then, um, if they already have a master's degree, are becoming graduate researchers and they may become that because they want to get a PhD, but they are first and foremost employed by the university and hence the university owns the work they do. So the professor usually acquires the basic research funding and then hires people to work on these research projects and then the work that people do is owned by the university. That also applies to bachelor and master students if the work that they do is uh, performed during a student helper job, uh, during a studentische or wissenschaftliche Hilfskraft job. Because then the university as an employer pays the students for work and acquires the copyright that way. And naturally the university which wants to stay on top of things, structures things in such a way that code that you write that is important to the university um, will have to be paid work, so you're compensated, but then the university owns it. They'll give it back to you, arguably, or they'll give it to you during incorporation if you want to, but you have to go to the university and negotiate with them. So again, um, if you want to do a startup, watch out how and when you're writing code, because only if you do it in a private capacity, uh, like a student in a degree program, then it's not paid work and you're not doing it on behalf of the university. As soon as it's paid work, you're doing it on behalf of the university who will automatically, by way of the work contracts, acquire the intellectual property rights. So I explained that right now uh, already. So in the student role, students own the rights to anything they do. 
voluntarily, so all the coursework is uh, yours. But if they take a job with the university as a student helper, by way of the contract they sign, um, they transfer the IP rights to the university. Uh, both, uh, both variants, uh, Werkvertrag and Dienstleistungsvertrag or simply student job, are possible. Um, so you can get compensated um, like in a salary job or simply for having performed a particular component, development of a particular component and delivered it to the university. So all of that is possible. Um, PhD students, if they are really coding for their dissertation and not on behalf of the university, would own the work, but that rarely happens because all they code they ever write is because of the research project that the professor uh, assigned them to. Uh, doctoral students really only write the dissertation in private time because they need a professor's permission to work on work-related subjects. You can always work, doctoral students can always work on personal uh, things anytime, but as soon as it is related to the research project that they got hired for, whenever they do it, wherever they do it, it uh, uh, falls under the work contract with the university, which is not a problem because from the university's perspective, foremost, the goal is to have the um, employees also be PhD students and get their PhD this way. So they uh, will be given the time to write the dissertation. And um, if they want to also do a startup afterwards, they simply have to negotiate with the university. Um, they have to do that in any case, because even if there was a mixture of code, uh, then uh, the that mixture required that the university still be asked for their part. But the universities generally want to make sure that there is no mixture and that it simply belongs to the university. So from the university's perspective, meaning from a professor who is an agent of the university and has to act on its behalf, competently has to act on its behalf, the professor for the university has to think about what dealing with intellectual property means. And so they have to think about any work they do with bachelor and master students and PhD students and make sure that any critical IP belongs to the university. That might mean setting up contracts. So paying students for their programming work on a student helper job or through a work contract or asking them to uh, whether they would be willing to simply gift it to the university or that they have no claims, they don't care, and so forth. Um, this is actually quite a laborious process that I've gone through a couple of times that our lawyers make us jump through hoops. What do we need everyone to, to sign? Nobody likes that because nobody likes to sign stuff, but that's what lawyers are for. Uh, they tell you where you need signatures. So I just clarified the stakeholders ignoring somewhat the university yet and focusing on the students, uh, the team effectively of the startup and how the university makes sure that it acquires the intellectual property rights to the work. Not uh, to withhold it from students, but to have a clean situation that allows a professor to continue doing their research work. It's not acceptable for a professor to let uh, students have a right in their work because then the students, by way of the exclusion right, that is copyright, could possibly argue, dear professor, dear professor and your PhD students, some of my code is in your work, I am the owner and you stop using it now which might be laborious in the wrong situations to remove that IP that you just lost as a professor the permission to use. So that's why it's also also why it's important that the university own all the copyright. And now, however, we want 
to give that intellectual property or we want that this IP goes into the startup, to the students, to the student startups. So how does that work with the, uh, with the university? Well, first of all, the start, there needs to be a startup, meaning there needs to be a company. You can't transfer the intellectual property rights to nothing. So this only kicks off once the startup has been founded. Then the startup approaches the university and asks, we want to take the source code that we developed in the original role while we were still employees. We want to take that out into the startup. Please give it to us. And um, usually the team knows exactly what it needs, so it can specify what it needs. The university usually then verifies that it can give you the rights or what rights it can give you. So to close source code, it can usually transfer you exclusive rights, though usually it will retain some rights returning to research and teaching. It can give you non-exclusive rights to anything where already licenses have been given to other third parties, including if you open source some of the work. And other intellectual property, they may also be able to give you exclusive or non-exclusive rights. What specifically you need really depends on your business, uh, business model. Now the university will actually want something in return, but can't just gift it to you. And the good news here is that universities are not mercurial usually. So you don't have to worry that they will charge you an arm and a leg because at least as of me saying this 2022, the universities care more about having generated or created successful startups than they care about making money off those which is debatable whether that's good, but they really want to see successful startups, so they will not, at least those that I know, will not put uh, stumbling blocks into your way. What the university might ask for is a lump sum payment. Um, that's unlikely because where are you supposed to have the money to pay out the university? Much more likely is that they will ask for small incremental payments conditional on the startup having any revenues. This works very nicely for you because only if you actually have any income from the intellectual property will the university get some of it to pay off your debt to the university that you acquired when they gave you the IP. Sometimes, but that's also quite unlikely, may the university ask for equity in your company. So most people I would ask I ask, fear that the university wants a lump sum and equity. And both is not desirable from the startup's perspective. And fortunately, both is not what the universities usually want. They want successful startups, not money of the startups. So the actual value of what they ask for in terms of euro that has to somehow match the value of the intellectual property. How to calculate that? Well, as everyone's guessed, there are different strategies for assessing how much worth is this source code here. Perhaps the easiest is to look at the costs. At this stage where the startup has barely, has just been incorporated, or maybe you address the university, you should address the university before you even incorporate, then the only thing really, or one of the ways of going about it is to simply look at the time that was spent on programming the code and using the time value and labor cost on calculating, calculating uh, the value of it. If you've got to go more fancy, you can of course, of course ask an expert an outside expert, an assessor, what might be the value of this code base. But if it's unproven in the marketplace, well, they will also just look at replacement cost, meaning how much time at what uh, quality of programmer. You could also go by lines of code, but this is getting silly. So all I have ever seen is uh, in this very early stage of pricing by labor costs. Now you have a price and you should negotiate or you can negotiate that rather than paying this as a lump sum, 
uh, you will pay it over the next five years or ten years you will pay off this sum and you do so depending on the income of the startup and so let's can argue okay uh, five percent of revenues or even profit um, of the first year that's what you will pay to the university to pay off your debt second year also five percent or maybe it goes up or maybe it goes down more likely it goes down until the sum of those percentage-based payments total the lump sum that you calculated as the initial value sounds like a fair deal it is really nice from a startup perspective because this does not create a significant hurdle this really actually makes it easy to take out the IP because um, if you don't make any money you don't have to pay anything if the company shuts down it's not invested money that is gone already because you just return the IP to the university because they don't care any longer anyway and so forth so incremental conditional payments up to a total sum that is the way to go and that is easy now I have never actually experienced it but in theory it's possible that a university may ask for equity in the company if they see a high promise they may ask for equity some stock in the company I don't think again that it's very likely and the reason for that is that they need to take care of what becomes an investment for them so you need to imagine the people at a university who are tasked with managing the relationship to startups there's sometimes a large number of startups in the making if they were to ask for equity in each and every one they are suddenly shareholders in 10 20 50 startups in parallel at my university i think we have two and a half people working on helping startups move out of the university are they going to join board meetings uh, Gesellschafterversammlungen? probably not it's just too laborious the people who manage the process often do not want to be tasked with attending and tracking uh, the uh, startups that come out of the university they'd like to sit on the sidelines and watch it be successful and write happy press uh, press releases but they don't want to be involved in the oversight of the investment it just takes time they are not professional investors if if it ever happens I've been told it's in the low two to five digit range perhaps so then we talked about the different phases uh, you go through after basic research applied research or validation research uh, the starting up phase or the spinning off phase where you incorporate and finally or next time the uh, actual startup phase where you need to raise funds from commercial investors next to public funders we focus really on public funding for the applied research and the spinning off phase here and who owns the intellectual property that you need for your startup you will not be able to acquire any funds from private investors if you can't show a so-called clean intellectual property situation if you don't own the IP that you want to build your product on you lose so you really need to make sure that a you know who has rights in most notably the code base and then you need to get all that IP out from under the university into your startup but as I explained that can be done is not hard and is actually a positive process for both sides because the university definitely wants you to succeed as a startup because it simply likes more successful startups so that it can claim to be a hotbed of innovation that's it from me for today for the session thank you very much for your time and attention and see you i will see you next time for the final lecture of this course on fundraising as a startup